Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Ambassadors Forum 2021 Fall Conference and to this breakout session. Our speaker for this session is uh, Brian Overholt. And the title of his uh, um, presentation is Grace Over Conflict, the Bible versus Critical Race Theory. My name is Noah Holty. I'm your host for this session, and I'd like to share a few of the ground rules for this meeting. First, to minimize interruptions and distractions with respect to our speaker and to our time constraints, your mics are muted. If you have any questions during the talk, please use the Zoom chat function and direct your questions to me. Um, my name will be changed to ask a question for clarity. Um, and don't address the questions to the speaker because he won't be able to respond to the questions or comments in the chat immediately. Once the talk is concluded, I'll present questions uh, that I've received via the chat window to Brian. And I apologize in advance if we aren't able to get to all of them because of time constraints, we'll do our best. Uh, now, before we begin, um, we'd like to open with a word of prayer. Uh, Brian, would you like to offer that prayer? Yeah, thanks. Heavenly Father, we just uh, we just give this time together to you, Lord, and, and just ask that as we um, discuss uh, these ideas involved in uh, critical race theory and uh, and the things that that lay at their foundations, Lord, that you would just uh, give us all clarity of thought um, and understanding for these things, uh, yeah, Lord, that that you would help to better equip us in that way to uh, to be lights to uh, the world around us uh, who have bought in to this ideology and uh, help us to, uh, to be able to navigate that um, in a way that is faithful to you and uh, honors and glorifies you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brian. And uh, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, guys, thanks for joining me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And... Uh, Make sure that works. Looks like it is. So um, as we said, my name is Brian, and this is Grace Over Conflict, uh, Bible versus Critical Race Theory, or a Christian Response to Critical Race Theory. And uh, if you guys have been following the, uh, the Ambassadors Forum for very long, um, you've probably heard more than a few talks about critical race theory. Um, but this is going to be a little bit of a different one than many of those. I want to share with you some background to critical race theory that has helped me wrap my mind around this movement in a way that I hadn't been able to before. Um, one of the things I like to say is that critical race theory, um, studying that is like looking at a, a tangled bramble of thorny vines. Um, I've spent enough time looking at it to see where this concept intersects with that one and how each one reinforces the shape of the whole bush but it's still just perplexing to figure out where you can start to untangle the mess and um i i i'm sure many of you probably feel like you're in the same boat so instead of spending time examining those tangled concepts i want to get at the root of critical race theory? What is the common thread or the common root that ties all these things together? And I think that when we find, what we will find is that this root is this sort of ill-conceived Western philosophical idea that is itself fundamentally anti-truth and anti-religious, anti-Western and anti-liberty. And it goes back a long, long time. But first, just let me show you what I mean when I call this a tangled bramble, as it is today. Um, some of you may have seen this picture before. When it went viral, it was thought to be a picture of our most recent Supreme Court Justice, Mrs. Amy Coney Barrett, with her husband and two of her seven children, um, these two being adopted from Haiti. Um, it actually was not her. It turned out to be some other unknown family, although she and her husband do actually have two adopted children from Haiti. Now, if you're like me, you see this picture and think that these look like two loving parents and two happy children, and that this is a beautiful thing for them to have done, to open their home and, and their lives and provide safety and security and affection and love to these two children that were without biological parents to care for them. Hopefully, we can agree that, that this is a wonderful thing. 
uh, but not everyone would see it as we do, unfortunately. One university professor by the name of Ibram X. Kendi captioned this exact picture with these words on Twitter. He says, some white colonizers adopted, in scare quotes, black children. They civilize these savage children in the superior ways of white people while using them as props in their lifelong pictures of denial while cutting the biological parents out of biological parents of these children out of the picture of humanity. Now, if you're not already familiar with Hindi or critical race theory, you're probably shocked by this statement. And you want to ask, is he saying that it's racist to adopt kids with different color skin? Is he saying that these kids would have been better off growing up without a family than with a white family? His thinking just seems absurd on the face of it. But if you are familiar with Kendi or critical race theory, you might actually recognize a few thorny vines in this bramble, this tangled perspective. Concepts like white colonialism, white supremacy, white savior narratives, and the, the supposed internal oppression, internalized oppression within these two kids because the parents who are raising them are white. But even recognizing those concepts, even if you do see that in this statement, how do we untangle the mess? We need to answer the question, what is the root of Kendi's worldview that makes him see such ugliness in a situation that many of the rest of us find beautiful and admirable? And to answer that, we're going to have to travel back in time quite a ways to find the philosophical root that this bramble grew from. So if we can grasp the root, I think we'll be better equipped to help other believers think biblically about this worldview. We can be better equipped to understand the mindset of the people who believe in this worldview, and we'll be better prepared to navigate conversations and opportunities to show the love of Christ to people who believe this worldview. So how do we get at the root? How we got to now? To understand critical race theory, um, or critical theories in general, we have to begin by understanding the philosophical tool that lies at its foundation, which is the modern dialectic. Now, that's dialectic, that's a philosophical term, and so we're going to have to talk some philosophy, and I'll try to make it as painless as possible for everybody, but we're going to see that this is the root of the bramble that we need to understand. So what is the dialectic? Well, that word dialectic sounds similar to the word dialect, um, like language. And the original Greek word actually does mean to converse or to have a conversation. This goes all the way back to Socrates and the Socratic method. He would have conversations and, and ask deep questions about deep ideas um, and help, help his conversation partners uh, to reveal the underlying assumptions behind their ideas. It was a very fruitful approach. And for most of philosophical history, that's really what the word dialectic meant. It was a conversation. Uh, but we aren't going all the way back to Socrates. Our philosophical journey begins near the end of the Enlightenment era. And at this time in history, philosophical skepticism had been growing for centuries. What does that mean? Philosophical skepticism basically meant that the the question that anyone wanted to explore at this time is how can we actually know anything? How do we even know that we exist, let alone anything else? Philosophers asking these questions wanted to develop systems of thought for grounding all of human knowledge. And there were basically two schools of thought for solving the problem of how we know things. There were first the rationalists on the one hand who said that all real knowledge had to be grounded an internal human reason and thought. It was all up here. The I think, therefore I am school of thought, like the Rene Descartes who started it all. And then the, on the other hand, there was uh, empiricists like David Hume who argued that we really don't know anything except for what we can observe with our senses. But notice what's missing from these two schools of thought. It's divine revelation. Neither the rationalists nor the empiricists leave any room for divine revelation as a source of real knowledge. And if I simply just ground all of my knowledge in my own reason or my own sense experiences, that reduces the Bible to being merely an object for me to examine with my reason or with my senses. 
either way, I become the locus of all knowledge and the Bible is just data for me to judge. So during the enlightenment, the divine authorship of scripture was questioned. Um, the Bible becomes just a document to be critiqued by men and God becomes this distant being whose existence is debated, but basically the major thinkers of the day agreed that little could be said about God other than that he might exist. And that was the enlightenment. That's where so many of, of uh, the famous deists of the early American history, that's where they got a lot of their ideas. And this was the soil in which the root of critical theory and the modern dialectic was about to start growing. And the seed for that root was planted by the first modern dialectician, Immanuel Kant. Um, and he thinks that he can finally lift philosophy and religion out of this pit of uncertainty about how we know things. Um, and he's going to do that using this new dialectic that has, doesn't look like anything that's gone before it. So Kant, in his critique of pure reason, Kant wanted to correct both the rationalists and the empiricists. He says, you're both half right. Kant thinks that we have some basic internal knowledge and reason that we are born with. And he says that we can have real knowledge about how the world around, the, the world around us appears, but we cannot know anything about the objects around us in themselves. So for example, I can see my computer in front of me right now and I can feel it, but that only tells me how it looks and feels to me not how it actually is, not how it is in itself. Um, so, but where does that leave God for Kant? To Kant, God is this transcendent object. It's, he's a thing that we cannot experience with our senses. So for Kant, we can't even know how God appears. So while he thinks that God must exist for moral reasons, Kant still says that essentially we can't know anything about God at all. So, and using that idea as a starting point, Kant goes on in his writings in, in the antimonies, uh, or antinomies, excuse me, he goes on to debunk the ontological argument for God's existence, the design argument, the cosmological argument, and he does all of that using this sort of new dialectic approach. Um, and this dialectic is not probing questions in conversation. You won't see any Socratic conversations in this approach. So Kant's new dialectic is usually summarized as thesis, antithesis, ugh, thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. That's kind of a tongue, tongue twister. Um, you propose an idea, that's the thesis, and then you propose a contradictory idea, and the collision of those two ideas will simultaneously nullify or destroy each other, but then they'll also reveal a broader, more absolute truth, and that's the synthesis. So how does this work? What does it look like? Well, to get an illustration of it, we can look at how Kant uses this to debunk the cosmological argument for God's existence. Now, the cosmological argument is based mainly on the idea that the universe cannot have an infinite past, and so if the universe had a beginning, something had to cause it to begin, and that cause must be God. Um, that is the thesis of that argument. And in his work, The Antinomies, Kant presents a good argument in support of that idea. But then he says, I could also make a good argument to support the idea that the universe is past eternal. And so he makes that argument. And now that's the antithesis. So, but then which one is right? Kant says, neither. Instead, all we are really doing is just arguing about the appearance of the universe and really, we can have no knowledge about the universe as it actually is. This is Kant's synthesis. Both the thesis and the antithesis are discarded in favor of what he thinks is a more basic and fundamental truth that we really can know nothing objectively true about the world. And therefore, observations of the world are excluded for establishing the existence of God. But this is just a terrible rebuttal. And it fails to solve the problem of how we can know things. If anything, we're more lost now than we were before. Just setting up one argument and then another contrary argument and undermining them both doesn't yield anything meaningful. 
Kant hasn't actually expanded human knowledge, he's diminished it. Um, but this is the birth of the modern day dialectic. This is Kant's dialectic. And he thinks that tools like this will be able to refine our understanding with the ultimate aim of a unified, absolute knowledge. And somehow he thinks that, that even though we will never know anything beyond mere appearances, somehow he still thinks we'll get to an, a unified, absolute knowledge. I'm not sure how that worked. But um, these ideas, this dialectic, also fascinated another young philosopher, uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Hegel. Hegel was obsessed with the historical developments of societies, and he was fascinated by Kant's dialectical reasoning. But more importantly for Hegel, he saw that uh, Kant's dialectic of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, he saw it at work not only in logic, but in history, in societal evolution. Well, how is that? For example, Hegel thought that he saw this process in the development of human freedom in society. He saw early human civilizations where there was no state and everybody was simply free to do what they wanted. And that's, that's the thesis. Everybody is just out there doing whatever they like. But that condition of society meant that some men were free to steal from or injure other men. Um, and that's the antithesis or the contradiction within that society. Um, and this contradiction led to the development eventually of hierarchical societies of lords and rulers that provided protection uh, to the people underneath them. Um, so that's now the synthesis. So, but for Hegel, this is an ongoing process. So that synthesis now becomes, um, now becomes the new thesis. So now the thesis is that hierarchical society, but the contradiction is that that those lords and rulers could overtax or abuse the people that they're supposed to protect. And those people then would eventually rise up and rebel against their rulers. And the result would be, there would be no more rulers that we had eventually develop democracy. So it's ruler you know, rule by the people and on and on and on. Every synthesis becomes the next new thesis. And where is this process leading us? Well, Hegel loved the state. He thought the state was fantastic. And so he thought this would eventually lead to socialism and then to communism. And then eventually the communist government would realize that it just didn't have any purpose. Uh, it wasn't doing anything anymore. And it would just dissolve itself and people would govern themselves in a utopian society. Um, somehow we get very, back to the first thesis and it would work. Um, so, but Hegel, called this dialectical process of societal negation and then, and then of evolution, he called this Aufheben, which he wrote extensively about in his Science of Logic. And now the word Aufheben in German literally means both to destroy as well as to preserve or to keep. And Hegel thought this word perfectly encapsulated what the dialectic produced in history. Each historical thesis is met with its contradiction. Both are destroyed, but the seed of the truth within them is more perfectly realized in the next societal synthesis. Um, and this is this idea of Aufheben. This is the root of critical race theory from which we've gotten the bramble that we have now. And this Aufheben or the dialectic was for Hegel, also the process of God becoming himself in human history. For Hegel, the God of the Bible was simply a centuries old primitive picture of reality. He felt that God was the absolute behind all of existence. And through the dialectic, God was in the process of realizing himself in progressively greater perfection in human society over time. So in fact, Hegel borrowed from the biblical idea of the Trinity. Um, he felt that symbolized human society evolving. For him, God the Father was the absolute force of change through ideas, and God the Son was the state, God manifesting himself among men in ever-improving governments. That's God the Son, and God the Spirit was the culture that was developed in these societies. 
Um, and this trinity, in Hegel's view, is inevitably driving us toward a perfect society at the peak of human history. And you still see this idea today every time somebody tells you that you're going to be on the wrong side of history. Well, why is that? It's because history is driving us toward this ultimate per perfect society and you're preventing progress. You're holding us back from the next synthesis. So you're gonna be on the wrong side of history. So where Kant saw dialectical reasoning striving for a more perfect absolute knowledge, um, Hegel saw the dialectical Aufheben driving history toward a perfected world as God or the absolute fully realized himself. So, but then Hegel's baton was passed on to Karl Marx, who himself, he was a young Hegelian. He loved Hegel's view of history and uh, man's pro progress toward perfection, the unstoppable societal dialectic of Aufheben but Marx really kind of hated the more mystical and religious aspects of Hegel's theories, all this talk about God and things. Marx was not content to just simply talk about God or to philosophize. He wanted action. Marx wanted to help history Aufheben along so that he could uh, create, or so he created this dialectical materialism and sought to unite these theories with practice which is where we get the word praxis that's used in scholarship so often now. So while Hegel was content to just sort of think big thoughts and wait on the world to change, Marx thought it was better to change the world actively by aufhebening the economy and the state. So what did this mean for Marx? Well, for example, if working class people think that they're prospering under industrialized capitalism, that's the thesis, Marx said, just convince them that they're really wage slaves with no real freedom. That's the antithesis. And the result will be that they'll become the awakened proletariat that rebels and, uh, and brings in revolution, ushers in socialism, and eventually communist utopia. That's the synthesis. Um, Aufheben, the economy, and the rest will just result. Um, and Marx thought that this was the inevitable uh, end for all capitalist nations. But as we come to the 20th century, the Frankfurt School is looking back on uh, Marx's predictions that all capitalist society would give way to socialist revolution and communism. But except for the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, Marx's prediction had failed in every case. Between Marx's failed predictions and his narrow focus on the economy, they felt it was time to revisit Hegel's dialectic and rethink how to apply it. So specifically where Hegel applied his dialectic of Aufheben to ideas and philosophies, uh, God the father and Marx sought to apply it to the economy or the state, God the son, uh, the Frankfurt school now was saying uh, that the surest path forward would, would be to apply Hegel's Aufheben to the culture itself, God the spirit. Uh, in Hegel's view. So in his essay, The Affirmative Character of Culture, Herbert Marcuse, who was a part of the Frankfurt School, he refers to this, this goal. Uh, he says, quote, it is the real miracle of affirmative culture that people can feel happy even if they are not. So people in capitalist societies think they're happy, but they're really not. And uh, if the culture, has entered a Western thought only as an affirmative, he says, the abolition of its affirmative, affirmative character will act as an abolition of culture as such. That phrase, abolition of culture, in German is Aufheben der Kultur. This was a major goal within the Frankfurt School and was also applied by the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci in his writings, which have tremendously influenced modern scholarship on these ideas. Gramsci wrote, any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values can't be overthrown until those roots are cut. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. In the new order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. 
And we're basically living in the logic of that statement right now. Many of us have heard the term cultural Marxism thrown around, and this is why. It is Marx's dialectical activism, which he adapted from Hegel, but it's now being applied to culture instead of the economy. It's literally cultural Marxism. This is the very thing that has brought us to where we are now. Today, we don't use the word Aufhaben. Today, it's cancel culture. Um, in scholarship, they use the word sublation or sublate. And uh, adopting the mindset to deconstruct everything in our culture this way is referred to as having a critical consciousness. But it all comes back to Hegel and his dialectic. Whatever today's thesis is, invoke the antithesis, contradict it in some way, and create the opportunity for deconstruction into the next synthesis. So what are some examples of that right now? Well, a commonly accepted truth today in, in today's society is that men cannot have babies. Most of us believe that. So what's the antithesis to that? In the new kind of woke critical theory crowd, maleness and gender are just a social construct. So therefore, what's the synthesis? Mothers should be called birthing persons. Uh, how about another one? Uh, another thesis is most of us generally think that um, that uh, the civil rights movement that ended racial discrimination and segregation was a huge victory and a huge step forward for America. That's a commonly accepted thesis today. The antithesis from the critical theory crowd, um, our society is actually more racist than ever and anti-discrimination and desegregation laws only masked the reality and they stole away black only spaces or spaces for people of color. So what's the synthesis? Well, it's the return of segregation on our university campuses and California's Prop 16 that attempted to repeal anti-discrimination language from the state laws. So why are we tearing down statues and defacing monuments to Abraham Lincoln? Aufheben der Kultur. Why do we need to keep track of every person's gender pronouns? Aufheben der Kultur. Why is it okay to say that black lives matter, uh, but all lives matter and blue lives matter are cardinal sins that will get you fired? Aufheben der Kultur. Whatever the culture accepts today has to be forcefully contradicted so that a better society will magically arise from the cultural rubble. And this is the thought process that undergirds every critical social theory at work in our universities right now. Um, queer theory, intersectional feminism, gender studies, critical race theory, just to name a few. So how does this, this manifest in critical race theory specifically? Well, we don't have time to go through all of the ways. Um, but here is a brief excerpt from an outline that I put together uh, of the six major tenets of critical race theory as distilled by Dr. Car Colleen Capper. She's this prominent professor and author of how to integrate social justice and equity programs, i.e. Uh, critical theory programs into public schools. If, and if you want the full PDF uh, that, I, that I put together of this, um, that link at the bottom of the screen, just write that down. Um, and you can go and download the full thing. Um, so, but we're just gonna look at one row of that document. <clears throat> and uh, we can say that in American culture today, most of us value objective truth and empirical facts over anecdotes. Um, but in matters of personal opinion and perspective preferences, we believe that a diversity of voices and equality of respect for varying points of view is a good thing. Um, it's e pluribus unum, out of the many, one. This is a thesis in American culture today. Okay, That's the left-hand column there. Uh, but what does critical race theory say about that? They bring the antithesis and say that while America may say that it values a diversity of voices, they say, no, it's clear that white voices dominate all the rest. The majority dominates minorities and that's not fair. So instead we need counter storytelling to push back against those majority narratives. And it says right there, these counter storytelling, uh, the, the, this counter storytelling aims to cast doubt on the validity of accepted premises or myths, especially ones held by the majority. 
And these majority narratives are also recognized as stories and not assumed to be facts or truth. Notice two things about that. First, majority narratives need to be made invalid, not because they are wrong, but because they are the majority. They are the current cultural thesis. And second, when it says that majority narratives are not assumed to be facts or truth, it's because nothing is considered to be fact or truth if it supports a majority narrative. And in this case, we're talking about white narratives. <clears throat> Why? Why would they say this? Because critical race theory sees white culture as a fundamental force for racial oppression in America. They, that even attempts, even attempts to be neutral and unifying really only serve to support systemic white supremacy. Cultural norms, categories, means of knowledge or truth have all been constructed by white culture to preserve only white power. That is their belief. So there is no, really no culture of diversity, they say, only the dominant class. And Antonio Gramsci called this dominant culture hegemony. And he believed that our language, norms, logic, math, science, these are all tools of systemic oppression. And in America, all of those things that I just listed are identified as white. This is why white people are told that they shouldn't speak on race and only listen. They should ask people of color to tell them what they should say. Because anything that a white person says, even if it's well-meaning, it is still a hegemonic act. It's stealing power from people of color because it's just another white voice talking. Even if you're merely sharing an objective true fact or, or statistic, the mere idea of objective factualness is seen as a white culture thing. That only, it only strengthens white supremacy, they think. And it silences minority narratives that are equally valuable, even if those narratives are factually untrue. So this, this graphic uh, from the Smithsonian Institute and their National Museum of African American History and Culture makes this point very clearly. Um, what does it say whiteness and white culture consists of? Uh, it says individualism, uh, self-reliance, the nuclear family, independent children, objective, rational, linear thinking, and an emphasis on hard work. These things are all supposedly white. People of color apparently would not be any of these things except for us forcing our white culture ways upon them. This ideology in this graphic is actual racism and it, it demeans and infantilizes the very people that it says it wants to liberate. But the reality is that the attributes that are listed here on this graphic are not here because they're white, because they're not white. This is not peculiar to white people. They're listed here because they are the common values of American culture today that, that we all uphold as virtuous. Um, and so those things need to be deconstructed. They need to be outhavened to make way for the next glorious stage of becoming, whatever that may be. So now you see that this concept of dialectic or outhaven um, is really so much easier to comprehend why critical race theory has arisen once we see this thread, once we see this root. It's, this is now Alfhaven being applied to race issues. And that's why uh, Ibram X. Kendi in our starting illustration painted such an ugly picture of interracial adoption as nothing more than white colonialism and racial sub subjugation. He's doing Alfhaven. This is why Kendi says in his book that it's impossible not to be racist. He believes that everyone must be racist because our whole culture is. The only question that really matters to Kendi is will you do the work of anti-racism? Will you work to negate the current cultural theses? Um, this is what he says in his book. This is why he says in his book that the only uh, solution to past discrimination is present discrimination. And the only solution to present discrimination is future discrimination. That's an actual quote. This is perpetual Aufhaven, perpetual negation of the current cultural thesis. Perpetual discrimination. This idea has been rotten and void from the beginning. 
uh, because mere negation does not produce anything new. You cannot add to a society through perpetual subtraction. So for Marx, um, you cannot reap utopian peace and collective contentment when you sow division, jealousy, and distrust, which is what he did. To Hegel, you cannot, uh, who saw freedom dialectically progressing from anarchy to hierarchy to democracy, and each of those societies failed, not because there were contradictions that needed to be purged through Aufheben. They failed because people are sinful. Fix the sin, and it actually doesn't matter what structure society takes. If, if man was perfect, communism could work. Any society could work if man is perfect. Um, but we don't have to solve the sin problem because Jesus already has done it. So, which brings us full circle to Kant and the Enlightenment. The answer to grounding knowledge is not new and strange logical tricks and mental categories. The answer is to ground truth in something higher than ourselves. Ultimately, all of this has developed, ultimately, over hundreds of years, because men felt themselves so wise that they could make sense of everything without God's word and sometime without, sometimes without God himself. They quite literally idolized human reason, but reason just doesn't have any wings to fly without the wisdom of God. And so began this philosophical death spiral of the last few centuries. So how should we as Christians think about this worldview? Well, it is a false gospel. Um, just like any other religion, this ideology tries to frame who we are, where we fit in the world, what kind of problem man, uh, it, what, what kind of pro the big problem of mankind is, what your moral duties are, and the ultimate salvation of mankind. And we can see there, whereas uh, on the screen, whereas the biblical gospel would tell us that, that we are each made in God's image, and the big problem is that we're separated from God because of sin, and the solution is Jesus and his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. And our identity is really just, are you in Christ or are you in Adam? Um, are you in sin or are you under grace? And, uh, and ultimately, salvation is eternal communion with God, present with him in heaven. Whereas critical race theory would say, their, their worldview would say that mankind, we're all just groups struggling for power. That the big problem of man is that some groups oppress others. The solution is that we need to use dialectic and just continually cancel everything until we finally arrive at utopia. Um, and your identity basically is just which, which groups do you identify with? Are you white? Are you male? Are you straight? What, what are you? And salvation is, is ultimately when all the inequities are eliminated and society is perfect, although nobody has any clue how we would actually get there. So further, we need to be aware that not only is this a competing gospel, a false gospel, but there is just simply very little to no common ground between this ideology and biblical Christianity. And we can see that outlined there on the screen as well. And uh, that also is actually more fully fleshed out in the PDF that uh, I gave you the link to earlier. Um, but I want to just, I want to verbally emphasize two points here. Um, number one, on that second line, the Bible speaks very little about the sin of racism. Racism is just not discussed in scripture very much because they didn't think in terms of race that much. There was plenty of discrimination, um, usually on the basis of national identities, not so much on the basis of racial identities. But the, the Bible does have a lot to say about partiality. And that is the key. Racism is just one form of partiality. If we want to have biblical conversations about racism, partiality is the biblical concept that we need to dig in and study and find what it has to say about partiality. Secondly, on forgiveness, that bottom line, we need to be a people as Christians. We need to be a people of radical forgiveness so that the world can see the healing that is produced by Christ-like forgiveness. The people who lost their loved ones in the shooting in Charlotte are an excellent example of this. One after another, going up to the shooter in the courtroom and telling them, telling him, I forgive you. 
that is what this country needs to see a lot more of. So finally, we'll close with this. How do we share Jesus with others who believe in this false gospel? Firstly, be quick to condemn racism wherever it exists. Do not gloss over racist events of the past. If we are too quick to argue against uh, critical race theory, so quick that we fail to grieve over the real evils that have taken place, then we're failing to speak with the love of Christ and will just appear to be callous and lose credibility. Um, secondly, remember that not everyone who uses the words equity or anti-racism really knows what those things mean. So that means ask lots of questions. What do you mean by that? Um, how do you know that this is true? Um, what is the, the end goal of this idea and how are we gonna get there? Uh, one thing I like to ask a lot of people when I'm, when we're discussing these ideas, just to gauge how how deeply they've bought into it, is to ask them, what do you think about interracial marriage? Should a, a, a Black woman and a white man get married? Um, and if they are already married, should they stay married? Should they get divorced? What are your thoughts? And a lot of times, um, people who have only basically bought into the bumper sticker version of critical race theory and don't really know anything about it, they'll say, oh, apps, you know, interracial marriage is, is beautiful, it's wonderful. Of course they shouldn't get divorced, that's a great thing. Um, but people who are very deeply entrenched in this ideology uh, very often would say, yes, no, uh, a black woman should not be married to a white man because she is basically internalizing oppression by being married to him. They should that that's, uh, it's just perpetuating racism and, uh, <clears throat> and that they should get divorced. So, but ask lots of questions um, it, and those questions will reveal underlying assumptions and, uh, and how deeply they have actually bought into these ideas. And finally, number three, be upfront about God's solutions in the Bible to the problems that critical race theory identifies. And uh, three of those really quick, God, Number one has already paved the way for every race and nation and tribe to live in perfect harmony and equality. Jesus died to save every tribe, uh, every people, every tongue, regardless of race. And his society, when we get there, will be the perfect one that they're all looking for. What they want, Jesus is providing, and he unites us all. There is no race or sex or class in his kingdom. Um, some might say that uh, that our brand of Christianity is just white Christianity and it's distracting people from our, our racial situation and it's keeping people from being woke. But I want to tell those people, actually, the Bible has awakened us to the real problem behind racism and oppression. And the real problem is sin and separation from God. We are woke. Jesus has already won the victory against sin. Um, but the world is asleep and they continue to reject him. And, and so they remain in bondage to sin and perpetuate these broken cycles in every area of life. And finally, reconciliation with one another will only be accomplished if we are first reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The dialectic of negation and conflict that exists today in critical race theory will not solve any of the problems in our society only the grace of Jesus Christ can do that. Um, the only hope for peace is to choose God's grace over human conflict. And uh, that is the conclusion to, to my presentation. And I'd be glad to take your guys' questions. All right. Uh... Thank you once again, Brian, for that presentation. Um, we have a question here, just a moment. So I have a question from uh, Carrie. She's asking if there's a place that we can get um, a copy of the PowerPoint online um, that you just presented. Uh, sure, I actually, Let's see. I mean, I can. Oh my goodness, what do I do about that? Um, I guess I would say uh, contact um, the ambassadors forum, and I'll make sure they have a copy of it. 
Okay. Um, I believe that uh, the contact email for the ambassadors forum is on the ambassadors forum website so if you want to receive a copy of the the presentation go ahead and yeah uh, look there and by the way this this whole talk is also uh is also uh, one that i've given for them before at their friday forum so um and it's being recorded here so you can always uh, uh re-watch this and uh, and look back over the slides that way as well mm -hmm. um this isn't a question, but uh, I'd just like to note that um, the link that you mentioned uh, during your presentation earlier, Brian, I posted that in the chat for everyone to uh, to copy if they want that. Excellent, uh, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions for Brian? I'm going to uh, allow people to unmute themselves if they uh, wish to ask verbally rather than in the text chat. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions in the the chat right now. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, we have a chat here from um, David Ellis. Seems like there's a lot of circular reasoning to justify critical race theory. Um, yeah, it, I I don't know. Um, I don't know if circular reasoning is the right term, but it's definitely convoluted. I would agree with you there. Um, it's it's reasoning based on a lot of a lot of uh, faulty assumptions and uh, um, ill-conceived philosophy, that's for sure. Okay, uh, and one other question here. Uh, what is your hope for the future? This all sounds kind of, you know, glum and, you know, things are kind of heading in the wrong direction in our society. Yeah. But, um, uh, in, for the immediate future, um, I'm not sure. The, uh, my hope is that a lot of people will begin to realize these things what we've just discussed today and begin to, to wake up. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, my hope is in Christ. He's, he is all of our hope for the future. Um, and we do know that, that uh, things will probably get worse before he returns and they get a lot better. Um, but, uh, uh, in the short term, I guess we'll just have to wait and see and trust the Lord. <laughs> uh, we have a note of thanks here from Jill. Um, she's saying, I will tell you that this is a great presentation of what's happening in public schools. All of the, cri cri sorry, all of the curriculum is uh, being conformed to encompass CRT, equity, and inclusion. It, it actually, it really is. And uh, our, our kids were actually in a, a charter school that uh, used to be very, uh, a solid charter school here in the Portland area. And uh, Unfortunately, we've even had to remove them from the charter school and put them in the only Christian private school that we were able to afford because they were adopting a lot of critical race theory, um, even as young as, as uh, kindergarten and first grade. It's, it's been really unfortunate. 
Okay, does anyone have any uh, final questions here? We're approaching the end of our, our time. Okay, well, it well, sounds like that's it. Yeah, thank you so much to everybody who uh, who joined me for this. I just really appreciate um, all of your interest in this topic, and it's important. I think uh, we all we all need to think hard about about the things that are happening right now and the ideas that are being pushed. And uh, you guys are doing that. Thank you so much. And thanks once again, Brian. Um, and we hope to see you all in the plenary session. All right. All right.